sorry about that. I, it gives me great pleasure, in fact, to introduce Professor John Marshall, who's Professor of Earth Sciences in Southampton. And um, as I understand it, uh, had started his career with a degree in natural sciences in Cambridge in, in the 1970s. He then moved to do um, a PhD in botany, um, which really does set the context, I think, for some of the things he'll be talking about today. And he did that at the University of Bristol. And then after a brief period um, in industry, and demonstrating at the University of Newcastle. He joined Southampton and has had a, a very successful research career thereafter. Um, and we are really privileged to have you with us today. Welcome and thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, and I guess I'll, I start. Um, and hopefully you can all hear me um, and we'll go from there. So this is some work we've done in East Greenland uh, over quite a few years, which really came and was published this year. And it was quite surprising, I think, for us in the end, what, what actually came out of it. So we're standing on the Devonian Carboniferous boundary. Uh, it's always at the top of a mountain um, with uh, two fish workers and two people who are students in, in Southampton who, who were sort of helping with logistics and so on. And you can see the, uh, the Gallic hand there. Um, there's a number of mass extinctions and certainly you're going to get uh, 24 hours of the uh, Cretaceous tertiary or the end Cretaceous or whatever. But here they all are uh, laid out in a line uh, against extinction occurrences where people have effectively counted numbers as a way of quantifying it. And what you've got, and it, it was been confusing for a long time, and in fact the person who did this compilation mislabeled it because they thought everything was at the end. But we've got two mass extinctions close together in the Devonian. We've got the late Devonian and the end Devonian, and they're separated by about 12, 13 million years of time. And they've got different names. Um, sort of the, the one I'm talking about is sort of the Devonian Carboniferous boundary mass extinction or the end Devonian mass extinction, EDME. And they all have names coming from German stratigraphy. Um, so it's sometimes known as the Hangenberg crisis. What goes extinct? And I'll mostly be talking about terrestrial things and it's fish. And you lose the entirety of the dominant fish group the placoderms, and these are the armoured fish. You also lose um, most of the ammonites, these, these sort of curly fossils, uh, which went on to be big in the Jurassic and Cretaceous. And um, if we go to the next one, you can see we lose towards very much towards the end, you lose this group of coral-like organisms, organisms are really sponges with the stromatoporoids. And things like the trilobites, how they have sort of a near-death experience in the late Devonian, have an even nearer end-death experience at the Devonian Carboniferous boundary. And they never come back as a big group at all. So they have a dominant group in the early mid-Paleozoic and they just shrink and shrink uh, through every mass extinction. So I, I just put this one up um, for the possibilities and asteroid impacts at the Cretaceous tertiary. And you're going to learn a lot about that uh, in a few minutes. And the other mass extinctions, um, end Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, are all factored in now with continental scale volcanic eruptions. And these authors or painters can never resist the temptation to make the volcanoes big. Um, but in fact, their fissure eruptions are fairly passive ones, um, like you get in Iceland, but they're just enormous in their scale and they destabilise the planet uh, depending on the speed of the eruption and so on. So this is now no longer favoured so much at the uh, Cretaceous Tertiary, Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. This is probably the best sort of systematic look at you can see at the terrestrial extinctions and their impact on the vertebrates. So that's fish and tetrapods in there. And 
what these are are all the fish localities which have been described laid in a line in a sequence so you don't really know the ages of them exactly but what you know is which one came first and which one came after and what you'll see is the colors change so as you go up to this um, Devonian Carboniferous boundary here, all the greens disappear. So the dominant group of placoderms, the armoured fish, um, and here's this, this one which obviously swallowed, big enough to swallow a person, Dunkleosteus, and they're all replaced and the vertebrate world changes forever. And so you're left with bony fish, which are the dominant group today, and the, the sharks. All the colours change to the blues and, and the sort of the reds and purples from the greens as you cross that boundary. And what you'll notice is that those fish barely notice the, the, the late Devonian extinction here, but this one is the big one as far as they're concerned. So we've been working in effectively the centre of the uh, Devonian land area, the old red sandstone continent. And we've been working in a basin about the size of Belgium in, in these sorts of scales. And we're in the southern hemisphere arid zone, very continental, very arid. Um, and it's dominated by dryland rivers. Effectively, you'd go there and it would light be in the centre of Australia. Um, you wouldn't see very much happening from season to season. Uh, but what we can get there is a, is a better understanding of what's happening on the continent because we see the extreme events. Whereas down on the beach, down effectively where we're sat now, most of us probably, um, it's, you're getting all sorts of influences from the sea as well as the climate system. How we get there, um, we use twin otters by and large coming out of Iceland and it has fairly big rubber tyres. Uh, you're running on 60 year old technology um, but that can land straight on a flat bit of tundra so this isn't really an airstrip it's just a bit of land with no stones on um, uh, in fact this is a cheat because it's taking off here because it's nose down but what you can't do is uh, take a picture before you land and that's dropped us off with all our kit inflatable boats there to then head off out um, to localities there and we travel around the sections in uh, a pair of Zodiac boats. And so we travel around in these Zodiac boats. We've got to carry everything. There's, there's, there's no way we can, we can get anything we haven't brought with us. Um, so you're carrying all the fuel you need to get home. So you quite often spend a bit of time looking at jerry cans, um, counting them and so on, and wondering what to do and having all sorts of uh, optimistic thoughts. Um, and you can see there the field section in the far, far distance. That's the start of the uh, Old Red Sandstone Devonian. And that's about 20 kilometres away. So this is a nice day on the water in East Greenland where it's, it's effectively mirror smooth. Uh, most days are not like this. And we're just running here past um, the uh, Canberra Division. Uh, we do meet with old friends from time to time. Um, I'd spent six months in East Greenland before I ever saw a bear. And now we tend to see them most seasons. And I think it's probably to do with the, quite rightly, the, the bear skin markets disappeared. They, you can no longer internationally trade them. Um, and so the local Inuit were always uh, permitted to take uh, a certain number of bears by traditional methods, traditional rifles. Um, so this is one which has come for a chat. Uh, it's a young one, so it's quite curious. Uh, so it's come to see us. Uh, last time I went, we met this one, um, and that's my boot, and you can see it's got slightly bigger feet. So it's the size of a smart car. I mean, they are large things. And this was causing a bit of a nuisance. It was climbing into huts on this base at night, and, and it was looking for food effectively, probably curiosity driven. Um, so here you've got a French cheese, uh, one of our expedition members brought with him and the bears have basically bitten half of it off and then 
sort of tasted it there with its front teeth and rejected it. It can't be that hungry. Um, one of the reasons we go is the exceptional quality to the sections. So there's a mountain, Backland Ridge, and what you can do is start somewhere in here and you can take a tape measure out of your pocket and you can run up and you can measure the entirety of it. So you can capture all of that geology and all of what's going on in there. The thing is capped with a, a sill up at the top, uh, which is why it's a bit uh, spiky. And we've got something like 40 million years of seven kilometers of sediment. And if you go to the shallow marine sections in Germany and Belgium, uh, they're much uh, less. Uh, sedimentation rate and you, you can't capture quite the number of events and see the resolution. So those are the sections we've worked in. Um, so we're over in this side of East Greenland at about 72, 73 north and uh, running here. So you're, you're talking of about 70 kilometres uh, between the sections and we were just coming out of that island there by boat to go down probably that fjord there to Celsius Pier. And I go there to find pollen and spores from land plants. Uh, this is a mega spore. It's big. It's about a third of a millimetre in size. And they're very resistant objects. They're made of this polymer, which um, can stand burial. It doesn't really change geological. It, it just basically toasts a bit in rocks if it gets a bit warm. And we can take things like hydrofluoric acid and we can dissolve them out. So you get the pristine objects more or less as they, they went into the rocks. Obviously the cell contents have gone. That's a megaspore covered in spines. That's a microspore, one of its friends. And that's sort of a normal size. So that's about 40 microns in diameter. So we could use them to tell the time. Um, but we, as you can see, we can also use them to tell us other things about climates, atmospheres, and so on. So this is the Devonian Carboniferous boundary, um, and we can see across it here. And I've just sort of put some, all of these are from East Greenland, and you've got a number of very major groups. Um, anything with, which has got these large spines of hooks on goes extinct. Um, this major group, which can be 60% of some uh, assemblages of spores disappears completely at the boundary and we'll talk about this one as well. And our surviving vegetation is quite simple. So it's a bit like going back to the early Devonian again and you've gone back to a vegetation of simple small plants. Some of the more complex spores um, do continue through, all of these continuous through the boundary, but they're very disrupted, they disappear for a while, uh, they go on holiday somewhere, survive somewhere, and then come back and spread around a bit more. I then there's a number of plants, seed plants, which just continue onwards uh, without really being um, seen. Um, this one is, is this 60%, uh, it's, it's called Retispore lepidophyta, and it's very distinctive. And here's a dot map showing where it is around the world in the latest Devonian. And it's effectively as, as successful as Bracken. So once it gets moving, it goes to all the continents with Devonian land on them. It goes to all the latitudes and it tends to go to all of the environments. So it's a hugely successful plant. And then it just goes extinct. So there has to be some reason why this super tolerant, successful colonizer um, just suddenly disappears and hopefully will come up with an explanation for you. This is another one, it goes under the name of Diadocytes, and it comes from the undergrowth to some of the forests. Um, so there's the forest trees, there's the understory layer, uh, the stuff you'd walk through. And so what you're losing is disruption of the major trees and the extinction of the understory layer. So your major elements in the ecosystem are basically gone and been disrupted. And you can see now why fish have such a problem, because you effectively destroy the habitat under their fins. And what we wanted to do was look at that spore record, but also match it to the forest tree record. And there's a number of sections in East Greenland where you can find quite large numbers of these trees. So there's a stick and there's a, a log branching there. And that's the base of a tree there, that's a stump 
and you can see a, a buyer over there for scale. So they're quite large forests you could walk through. And the best sections here on Celsius Berg, um, but all the actions at the top above about a uh, thousand meters in height. And we eventually got bored. You, you have to walk four hours up and four hours down because you're going across the rubble. And so the secret to working up there we discovered was to actually go and bivouac up there. Um, so here's our little temporary camp we put up. And you can see, you know, it, it was with quite exposed position up there, but effectively you can carry the food up and work for several days. Um, there's the Devonian Carboniferous boundary in the distance, and you can see a solitary figure uh, standing on there collecting fish. So what we did was we quite simply, three of us stood in a line and we went up the slope and we counted all the plants and we measured the diameters. And then we turned around and went down the slope and counted them all and plotted them in against altitude, which were then converted to thickness of rock. And what you can see is you've got quite diversity of logs arriving of different sizes and shapes um, in, uh, in this section. And then suddenly they've gone and the forests have disappeared. So you can get the, the mass extinction both in the terrestrial plants uh, as well as the spores and pollen. This is a fairly typical boundary section on the mountain called Stensio Bjerg. Um, and we found that in 1996. And if you study microfossils, you never know what you've got until you get home. Um, and so we didn't really realize the significance of what we were standing on. And so we went back again in 2006 and really sampled it properly and then dropped in on it in 2009. And you can dig it out, that looks a bit of a mess on the top of the mountain, um, but in fact under there there's fairly solid rock and you can sample through at high resolution. And what you get is this quite complicated little diagram, um, but you've got a lake here and a lake here and they're separated by a time when the lake dries out a bit, so you've got two lakes. And that gives us a timing, but probably about 20,000 year Milankovitch cycles. And what you can see is all the spores come up to this level and stop. These are the ones which go extinct. These sort of gently disappear. Uh, they've got longer records um, and some of them come back in the upper lake. And you've got an exceptionally high carbon content of organic matter, which reaches up to 21%. And you really have to struggle to find that sort of carbon content in a modern lake, um, never mind this one. And the assemblage which comes back when the trees and plants come back is this rather simple one. So you've gone from diversity to simplicity in its assemblage. And what I really wanted to know was, was this extinction a slow degradation? Did they just drop off in here or did they suddenly stop? And the problem was with such a high organic content that the samples of the high or the TOCs, 5, 10, 20 percent, were full of this. And we know this is amorphous organic matter and it's this sort of brown fluffy stuff which dominates the assemblage. And you're farther away from a lake beach, you don't get so many spores and what they are are obscured by this bulk of material here. So what we always wanted to do was find um, a section at the edge of the lake, effectively on the lake beach. And we always had this one at Rebel Backer, which the, the Danish Geological Survey, the Greenland Survey, had, had found in 1985. And what they'd shown us was there were late Devonian spores in the section, Carboniferous spores in the section, so the boundary had to be somewhere in there and it was a matter of uh, recognizing it. So we had a, a couple of looks at it in 2009 and 2012 and 
couldn't locate it at all. Um, and obviously what, what they'd done in this work, because we've done what we all tend to do for a time in Greenland, is they'd flown by helicopter to the bottom of the mountain, then they gone through the mountain in a day, and then been picked off the top at the end of the working day, uh, whether that might be 12, 14 hours. Um, and so a lot of this is always assembled quite quickly because you've got big sections and endless numbers of them. And so in 2017, we effectively took a chance and uh, took a helicopter. So rather than trying to work from the beach, which is uh, something like a 12 kilometre walk, um, we effectively got nearer to the section. And here it is just leaving us and there's all our kit. Uh, so we're hoping we've remembered everything at that point. And we're also in the right place uh, because we gave him a, a GPS coordinates, which he then converted into the name on the map and was duly about to drop us in the wrong place. Uh, but fortunately, we we're sufficiently aware of the geography that uh, uh, we managed to steer him in the right direction. Um, and so here we are just in the helicopter approaching it. And then you have to make fairly snap decisions as to where you want to be. Um, so we basically dropped on that plateau there near a stream so we could have some water. And then worked in these ravines uh, across the side. So there's something like seven ravines on that side. And we found the Devonian Carboniferous boundary was only in one of them. And so what you're doing is looking for half a metre of mudstone in there or half a metre of mudstone in here. And so we got a tape measure out and basically worked up these ravines and across and across uh, behind and behind to assemble a section. So that's the detailed sort of work of sedimentary logging, which means you actually capture the section in metres and you also find what you're looking for because you're looking at it deliberately to write it all in a notebook. You see a lot more things. So there's the boundary lake, uh, the Vernon Carboniferous boundary, and we didn't know it was a boundary until we got home. Um, so obviously I always carry some effectively in my pockets uh, to drop in my lab and in instantly we get back because you basically got to sample it thinking and hoping that it's correct. I was standing on the side of a steep ravine here so you can't get decent pictures uh, because there's nothing behind me apart from space. And what we got uh, was lots of beautiful well-preserved spores in a diverse assemblage uh, near the edge of a lake and our fluffy amorphous organic matter wasn't present um, so we'd managed to get into the shallower water without a stratified water column and what that showed us was the equivalent of a lake at the section on Stensia Berg, which was full of organic matter here we got the spores and they showed it was entirely carboniferous the last Devonian spores were here that Lepidophyta was there. And so it was a sudden extinction. Everything Devonian had gone um, at that point. And you've got to raise a sharp ability to pick that boundary. And um, so good spores, and we started to get these quite nice spiny ones. But the big surprise for me, and I can still remember looking down the microscope and seeing them, was that these ones, which are normally beautifully made, all had malformed tips. There was something wrong uh, with all of them and they weren't effectively developing correctly. And uh, the whole, whole host of different morphologies, uh, you can see there you've got ones where the uh, spines are spaced out irregularly and they've gone to different sorts of club shaped tips. This one they've all developed into sort of twisted ends um, also like tripod bases and they're all different so it's lost that ability to make its sculpture make the spines on the walls properly. Now, this one has just gone to shapeless warts on the surface. Um, they're probably in the right position for them but it's lost its ability to make these pointy ends on them. And what you'll notice this is a single species and it's always got these three spots um, and there's one which is just really not tried at all. And it's just dropped the, uh, the material which makes the sculpture in irregular masses on the surface, not knowing where to put them. And this one's not even managed to form that external wall, but it's got those three spots, one, two, three, which tells you it's the same species. And a lot of them stayed as tetrads. So 
they have a process of a meiotic separation where they split from one into four and they stay in the fours so they never split out again. And you can see this one is almost opaque and it's got malformed and it stayed. So that would be sterile. That would just what wouldn't work as a pollen grain or a spore or anything. It wouldn't be able to grow. Now, if you look at Palinomorphs a lot, they're all beautifully objects and they're under gene control when they're making these spinose processes. So that's effectively what they do. Um, and any number like this, and it's all regularly spaced and there's a bit of variation in length, but they're always coming to the same sorts of tips. Um, and that's one of the, the ones I've just shown you, which is sort of nicely where out there. And this has got all the same size, little bit of variation, but always going out to these little warts at the edges effectively. And we know this problem from modern experimental work, or we, or we know what it is. So here you've got a, a spore mother cell, which is in the sporangium or the pollen sac or whatever, and it splits and it splits again. Now, because it splits, what it can't do is put its protective overcoat on until it's done that final split. So once it's got to that stage, it can then lay down this outer protective wall, it's, which is what we recover as a fossil, which is resistant to hydrofluoric acid. And so that effectively waits to lay that one down. And so what you can do is damage it at this stage with ultraviolet light. And one of the reasons why pollen is yellow, or the, the reason it is yellow, is it because it gives ultraviolet protection. And so they effectively know that they can be damaged by UVB, like we can, and our cells can, and our DNA can. Um, and they protect themselves by making a resistant wall around it. But they can only put it into the system once they've done this final split into four. So at this stage, it's susceptible to damage to the DNA. And what happens is that base pairs in the DNA covalently bond with each other. So when you try and replicate it and unzip the DNA, it's basically got these faults in it and, and sort of jumps across them. And living plants are in fact, they, they show the same thing. So if you uh, point a sun lamp, a UV lamp at a plant, turn it on, it will start at that minute effectively to respond and put more UVB absorbing compounds into that wall to give itself protection. So it's no different from us developing a tan. And you can see this, this is the, the lake, the half of the lake where we found palinomorphs in or found spores in, and you can see the bulk of them are malformed. And the normal ones, absolutely the minority, um, the malformed are, are the majority, and certainly a measured colour as translucency. And so it, you're measuring at how much light you can get through. And you can see as you go into the lake bed, more and more of them becoming dark. And we can see that this is what it's telling us is that there's been a sort of significant and persistent damage from UVB light exactly coincident with the lake. And uh, here's another spore. Um, here's a little collection of them below the lake and they're all yellow with nice uh, warts over the surface. And what you can see up here are above and a slightly more orange, which is interesting. And again, they're perfectly formed and they're all similar. Go into that lake bed and what you've got is a whole uh, mixture of different sorts. Some are quite pigmented and these tend to be a bit larger and you could probably suggest that those were functional and some basically don't try at all. They're stunted, they're small and they've not developed properly. And so you can see the malformation in that lake. Now, what we know, and it certainly happened at the uh, two of the boundaries, perma Triassic, Jurassic, Triassic Jurassic, you get malformed palinomorphs and you've thinned or lost most of the ozone layer. And the probably the kill mechanism at the perma Triassic Triassic Jurassic is that you get um, these large igneous eruptions and they put up so much material um, and, and sort of various types of uh, reactive species into the atmosphere that the ozone layer's gone and then you can get the damage. 
Now, we know that because A, we can date the eruption, and B, because of mercury. So the major source of mercury is from volcanoes. And if you have a planetary scale eruptions going off, you get a global mercury anomaly. And that mercury is captured in sediments and absorbed onto organic matter. So what you do is you measure the amount of mercury and really divide it by the carbon content in the rocks and you look for an anomaly. And so the initial thoughts obviously, and people have suggested it a number of times, um, is that you had a, um, a, a large igneous eruption, nobody's ever found it, at the Devonian Carboniferous boundary, and, and, that, and we'd found the evidence for it. But a problem comes when you start to measure the mercury through the section. So our Deep Lake locality has a mercury anomaly. It goes up to 200 parts per billion. But when you divide it by the amount of organic matter, it effectively flatlines. Where we've got the malformed spores, you can see the carbon contents are much lower and the mercury, there's no anomaly, it's five parts per billion. And so again, that becomes a flat line uh, data set, there's no anomaly uh, and there's no hint of mercury. So here we are exactly a coincident with the malformation. So we should be exactly coincident with the large igneous eruptions. And our intermediate locality, uh, slightly higher, running at about one, one and a bit percent carbon content, but you're down to five parts per billion mercury. And again, it flatlines. And if you compare these to the, the sorts of anomalies you get at the Triassic, Jurassic and the end Permian, they are significantly different. And they'll show this anomaly will be on the scale of thousands. I've just flattened it down to 500. Now, it's interesting and what we're getting is this coincidence of malformation with warming. And suddenly we're in this rather arid uh, basin, a bit like Death Valley, and suddenly we get a deep, wide, permanent lake for 20 odd thousand years. Now, I've just brought you here into um, the United States. Um, this is the Triassic Jurassic Rift, and this shows it quite nicely in that what you've got there is a lake and it's that's black in colour and that's your permanent stratified lake. This is the Playa Lake, the impermanent lake at the edge, and there's the um, fluvial sorts of margins or the edge of the lake and that's where you find dinosaur footprints there. And you've got a symmetrical cycle and these are being driven by orbital cycles by Milankovitch cycles. And one of the reasons I've brought you to the uh, Triassic is to show you that the process is, is uniform through the, uh, certainly through Phanerozoic time. And it's what it is, is the monsoon circulation um, reaching into the dry continental interior and effectively it rains in the wet season and it rains a lot and you can get a permanent lake. And there the cyclicity faded a bit. It's not so warm and it's gone cool and arid. And it happens today. Um, and so here you've got um, Egypt uh, plus there's the just at the end of the ice age when the climate system is most active and it's warmest. And that's mega Lake Chad. And that's full effectively. It's a giant lake. And you can see the East African lakes are all different sizes, um, apart from the very deep long ones. And that's because they're full and they're all discharging both to the Indian Ocean and into the Mediterranean. Shoot forward to now and the climate system isn't as active, there's not so much heat in it at the moment. And what you've got is Lake Chad has shrunk in size, that's its job, it's in this climatically sensitive position. The uh, the lakes like Lake Victoria and the Rift Lakes are more equatorial, so they just got smaller rather than disappearing. And so it's exactly the same process happening on a thousands of years scale. And so what we can see is that we've got a system where if we follow this A to B to C to D, um, is you've got a process which has been modelled and which has been measured now where you have a mid-continent 
And if it gets hot in the summer, you then uh, start to push up more water vapour and you can get naturally occurring ozone destroying compounds. Effectively, some plants, some fungi, some algae will produce methyl chloride, methyl bromide as part of their metabolic pathways. And then they release this as a gas and that will then go up and it will come up to the ozone barrier and catalytically start to degrade it. That then increases the UVB and the plants then react to this by um, the ones which have got their reproductive bits waving in the air, then become sterile and the ecosystem collapses. It's highly selective in that if you can probably grow vegetatively um, as <coughs> horsetail ferns and bracken can do, you basically survive it, you don't notice it. Um, but you you destroy that forest ecosystem. And so you're going to a sort of scrub with scrubby plants. The forests are gone and you get a nutrient flush to the oceans. And what we know about the boundaries, we get very extensive black shales in the sea and that will produce more methyl chloride, more methyl bromide. I mean, that produces more of these little molecules up there. And the whole thing uh, has a positive feedback on it. And eventually, um, you've got this plankton are removing CO2 and that cools it down. And plus you pass the peak of the Milankovitch cycle and, a, a, and then you, you cool it down and the system shuts. So we get a, a very effective extinction mechanism which lasts for just a few thousand years. And we've been able to find it because we've obviously found a terrestrial section in the right place um, on the edge of this lake. And the, the interesting lesson we felt for us was that we're going through a significant warming now and effectively it's a warning from deep time that this mechanism may well be happening. Now we obviously published a paper on it and what then happens of course is the astronomers wake up and for 50 plus years they've always had a suggestion that we're going to get extinctions from supernova. Uh, this is a, a massive star collapsing its core and what you get is a cosmic ray blast from that. And there's always be, been this suggestion that this would then cause death on Earth, X-ray bursts or cosmic ray bursts, and the cosmic rays will strip off the ozone layer. And um, it's always been, a, I wouldn't say a sort of a, a standoff, but the astronomers say one thing, we say, don't think so, where's your evidence for it? You're just showing a process, show us how it actually happened. And of course, what they've done is they've reinterpreted this data, our data, as saying, well, obviously what you've done is found a supernova. And it, this is interesting because as well as having this um, cosmic ray blast, you'll get a bit slower, will arrive a dust cloud. Well, it won't be a cloud, it'll be dispersed dust. And in the hearts of these stars, you get certain isotopes, which you only get on Earth in nuclear reactors, but don't occur naturally. And one of them is plutonium-244. And so what they've given us the ability and the section to be able to test this supernova hypothesis. And so uh, obviously the plan is to then um, start, I mean, we've got a radiochemistry group uh, who can analyze the plutonium-244, which is no easy feat. In, in really quite small numbers, uh, more or less counting single uh, atoms of the stuff. Um, and that will enable us to test this hypothesis. So um, our sort of uh, terrestrial warming may survive, or we may be looking at this one as a parallel death from outer space, uh, as in with asteroid impacts. Um, always use collective efforts and I've always benefited from the support of CASP in Cambridge, uh, for getting us logistically there and importantly for getting us logistically back. And plus for one field season, we had some uh, important funding from uh, National Geographic. So probably the advert is keep buying the yellow magazines. Thank you. Uh, Professor Marshall, thank you uh, very much indeed. Uh, that was a particularly fascinating talk. Um, Certainly for me, it was an introduction to a lot of uh, new aspects that I haven't previously thought about. So I'm sure um, that we will 
uh, have a number of questions following up on that. And I'm just at the moment looking at the Q and A session to see if there are what questions there are that have come up here. Uh -huh. um, and none Do of you... them actually relate to your. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so... I can't see any questions coming in. Um, no, I let's... could earlier. Do you want to see me at all? It would be great to see you. That would be fantastic. I think we'd all um, appreciate that. So, in fact, I want to turn uh, on the camera. Right. We do have some questions actually here. Um, so, coming in, there's one now that says, and to find your camera, you'll probably go to the bottom of the page. And... Yes, it, it says I can't start it okay. because the host has stopped it. Um, <laughs> will benefit from just speaking to you. Sorry about yes, that. Yes, that's all right. Don't worry. It's, yeah, who knows? Um, ah, so and I can see the Q and A. Keep going. Brilliant. So, is is there any other evidence or way of testing other than the plutonium that you were just talking about? There's about two other elements um, which you can look for. There's a uranium. Part of the problem will be the half-lives are quite short, so there won't be much of it left because we're talking a 300 million. Um, we've also got to go back and recollect because they want maybe half a kilo of sample uh, to try it. Uh, so it, it, it's the material we've got. So what we want to do is to go and shallow outcrop drill it um, and get some you know, much more pristine samples and then we can have a go. Um, um, that, that's that's great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, uh, uh, Tony Dore here, co-host. Just just a, 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 a addendum to that question. What um, does, doesn't the cosmic dust arrive a, a, a heck of a lot longer than the actual cosmic rays? Uh, yes, I, I did some calculations light. with quite a few zeros in, and I reckon it was about five thousand years separation at the peak. So um, the the limit for this is an extinction mechanism is apparently about 10 parsecs. Um, so if you look at the distance between the speed of dust, as in Cassini, and the speed of the, uh, the, the cosmic rays, uh, they take about 5,000 years difference to get out to 10 parsecs. So in the samples, because we know these are probably procession driven lakes, we have the time in there to be able to find the dust. And um, we do have a question from the audience. Um, somebody obviously impatient to get the answers. When will yes. the analyses be ready? Um, well, we've, we've not started. Um, we've, we've got, as I say, we've got to acquire these new samples really to do it. Mm. And because it, it's quite a different amount of rock you need, um, mm. half a kilo perhaps. And it's then got to undergo a chemical separation and you've really got to watch out for contamination. And uh, they did tell me, but you're counting more or less, you know, 50 atoms of something of it. But that's the, um, the type of uh, accuracy and precision they can get now. Um, so it's possible it probably 10 years ago, we couldn't have done it. Mm. And you've got to thank Chernobyl for that. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. Um, would there be professional uh, preferential adherence of those uh, molecules in, in the sediments? Yes, it will tend to um, bind onto the organic matter. Right. And it also helps that we're in a lake because it, it'll obviously rain out across the globe. But in a lake, a better capture system for radionuclides than say going into the oceans. And there are a number of other questions now which I suspect you can see as well. So um, in the Devonian Carboniferous, what were the carbon dioxide sequestration plants? Um, we, we've got a lot of uh, prasnophyte algae. So there's no coccoliths, um, the, 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 there's no diatoms. Um, and then you've got this, this group of organic wall ones, the acrotarchs, uh, which we don't really know what they are, but they're probably dinoflagellates, if you take a guess. 
Thank you for that. Um, and what caused the spike in sedimentation at the Devonian Carboniferous boundary, which led to the perceived mercury, mercury anomaly? anomaly? I mean, people have certainly, and they published it this year, there's been a, a group based largely out of Poland who were working on the large igneous province, massive eruptions for the extinction. And they've searched high and low around the globe looking for this anomaly. And they find a few spikes, but nothing as you see in the say, the end Permian. And probably what they're finding is pyrite. So in other words, it absorbs, uh, mercury absorbs onto certain minerals and it absorbs onto pyrite. So you can actually get a nugget effect in your samples if you're not careful. Uh, so the anomaly is not there. There's also nobody's been able to find the large igneous province and date it. Um, so to a certain extent, they're guessing. Yes, and uh, this isn't here, but is, is that uh, affected by uh, secondary processes, oxidation and... Um... Yes, it, it can migrate around. Um, so which is why it's good. So they tend to look for black shales. It's the perfect matrix because it locks in there and stays in there. There's quite a lot on mercury geochemistry in lakes uh, because of the Canadians and mineral mining. And mercury analysis is quite easy because it's a toxic metal, metal found in, in waste sites. Therefore, there's simple analysis, automatic, semi-automatic systems for measuring it to parts per billion. Um, I mean, the next step we're doing is getting some mercury isotopes measured, uh, which is much more difficult. And that will tell us, um, you know, volcanogenic sources and so on. OK. And uh, there, there were a number of, of other questions relating to... Um... How reliable is the radionuclide? I, I mean, it, it's something we're going to try. And um, it, it's... It, you, I think you have to try it. I mean, it may not work. We may, so we, if we find it, the prize is that we know that the Earth is vulnerable to supernovae as mass extinction mechanism. And that's a, something significant to think about. What you then do about it, you don't know. Um, if we don't find any, we can probably discount it. Um, uh, hang on. Yes, um, I, I think the Milankovitch, what we have, I, I didn't really talk about it because of time, mm -hmm. is you've got a quite, you've got an ice ages or a, a latest Devonian ice age. And this warming we're seeing is the, is the warming from the collapse of those ice sheets. And that ice age, the last glacial episode in it, brings ice to very far towards the equator to about 35. And so it's a very short, sharp cooling, and that's then followed by a very rapid warming. And the two are working as a pair, which is why we think it's Milankovitch. And we don't think it's anything to do with CO2 dropping because of the way it can respond in both directions. So if you lost the CO2, you had too much CO2, you wouldn't get the ice age quite the same way. Yeah. So, um, it, and, and I think the idea is it's, it's something to do perhaps with the way the Milankovitch cycles are reinforcing each other and maybe drop into phase at that particular point in time. And the planet and the evolution of plants and the early forests has put the Earth system into a particular condition. And what you can do is flip it over. And so we've obviously noticed this and it'll be interesting to see if you start to try and map out ozone across the logical time, whether some of the smaller extinctions are not related to this. So once you, and it'd be like the KT boundary, when people realized there were asteroids implied, they went around every mass extinction level and a whole more other levels measuring for iridium to try and prove it or not. So it suddenly opens a whole new sort of direction of study. Um, and Phil Manning has actually asked you a question. <laughs> right. Um, might, might this extinction mechanism have driven or selected for the adaptations we see in tetrapod skin? Yes. From the more pr primitive 
amphibian-like skin to rougher reptilian skin? What we know is that if you want to cause mutations in amphibians and things, you, you give them ultraviolet light. Um, and so anything in shallow water and shallow water extinctions, because UV does penetrate a few metres, would be quite vulnerable. Um, and, and so uh, you, you go from multi-digited to five-digited as you cross that boundary. The five may be there already. So it opens up a whole interesting set of ideas if you suddenly bathe the planet in UVB um, as to what it does and how it might suddenly uh, move ev evolution along. Um, there's a question about seed bearing plants. Yes. And um, it, uh, it's probably a big lottery. In other words, if you're a scruffy little plant, but you can survive in your roots from year to year, you survive it. If you're an annual and you rely on having successful reproduction every season, you're dead. If you're a big tree, you might be able to survive it by having successful reproduction every 30 years. So we, we don't imagine it's, it's every winter's bad. And, and you, could, you could imagine that there's some areas of the planet where you live down, a, you know, plants down a ravine, there's not so much sun. So there's a peculiarity to the selectivity. And it may also depend on how the plants hold their reproductive structures. And so certainly seeds are much more enclosed in something. And so they may be, be more protective or it may just be to do with a life strategy. So we, we've not really answered all the questions and that relies on uh, good reconstructions of all the plants at the boundary, plus knowing which spores go with which plants. And we don't really have that information yet. Uh, you can only speculate uh, so far, which obviously we do. And the organic resilience of the spores and pollen themselves, I mean, do we understand it, how that adaptation took place? Um, it's, it's a super polymer. And fortunately, nobody's been able to synthesize it uh, because if they could, would be surrounded by sporopollen and uh, so that's waste debris because it would last for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and so it, it's a, a polymer. The, the plants have got pathways to synthesize and they effectively put it into pollen walls and spore walls. And it's just very resistant. And it's just magic that it's resistant to hydrofluoric acid so you can dissolve a rock and get out the fossil pollen and spores. So it, it's the whole basis to, to studying pollen and spores, certain acritarchs in sediments in that you can bulk dissolve the matrix away. Whereas if this was a foraminifera, you would basically dissolve the foraminifera along with the matrix. So it's that differential. And it's just one of these fortunate biochemical things. Well, I'm going to have to draw things to a close now because we'll need to um, prepare things for the n final talk of the afternoon. But um, I can't see everyone, but I, I'm pretty confident that uh, I, I represent everyone in thanking you for an ex extremely well presented, very well explained. I'm a non-biologist and I am taking away an awful lot from that presentation. And you set the context with your field work. Uh, we understand the geography. Uh, you've just given us so much to think about uh, in a very well informed way. And it's obviously many years of research as well put across in an incredibly eloquent way. Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, you know, it's it, it, this, this year we published it. So we obviously expect some interesting feedback. <laughs> yes, and we wish you well with the next <laughs> research. Yes. Look forward to having you back to tell us about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Right, I'll, I'll let you move on with dinosaurs. Yeah, and thank you for all the questions as well. Yeah. Uh, really good.